President of the Parliament of Greenland, President of Iceland, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I bring you greetings from Rome, from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and from the Director General of FAO, Dr. Graziano, and uh, Mr. Martisen, who is Assistant Director General for Fisheries and Aquaculture at FAO. Now, the previous discussion has clearly demonstrated how important living marine resources are for the economy, businesses, and future welfare of the people and populations of the Arctic. And this applies both to uh, coastal and small-scale fisheries, as well as to industrial fisheries. Um, it has, the discussion here has also reinforced the view that FAO, as well as the UN as a whole, have a, an important role to play in this respect. Most people know FAO as, a, as an organization for development cooperation, very active in the southern part of the world. But in the context of the Arctic, its normative and standard setting role, especially regarding oceans and fisheries, is more important. And when I, when I speak of normative and standard setting role, I mean uh, international agreements, voluntary guidelines, uh, plans of action, uh, etc., which the membership negotiates upon. And uh, to begin with the mandate of FAO, which is achieving food security for all, uh, the eradication of hunger, food insecurity, as well as driving forward of economic and social process and progress for all, and sustainable management of natural resources. And it's important to, uh, uh, in this respect, to uh, know that indigenous people are about 5% of the world's population, but 15% of the global poor. So this tells us quite a story. I would like to address the issue today from the perspective of the FAO, as well as from universally agreed UN efforts, and concentrate mainly upon two aspects. Uh, the FAO, the global work of the FAO in the service of indigenous people, and secondly, the work of the FAO in the service of sustainability of living natural resources. To begin with indigenous people, uh, the fundamental UN document in this respect is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which was referred to previously today. And there are, of course, several other uh, conventions and regulations. The UN has also created the Permanent Forum of Indigenous Issues, which is incidentally taking place in New York this week, I believe, as well as the post of a special rapporteur on the rights of these people. Now, FAO has also uh, done its best, and in 2008, it adopted a new strategic framework for the years 2010 to 19. And, uh, Indigenous people are especially mentioned in the plan's objectives regarding issues of sustainable management of land, water, genetic resources, as well as biodiversity. Two priorities in the framework are especially important for the topic of our discussion today. And allow me to mention those, that is the use of new communication and knowledge systems better access to information, as well as preservation of traditional skills. And secondly, the increased economic opportunity for sustainable livelihoods. One of the major constraints of addressing the needs of indigenous people is the lack of access to markets and financial resources, creating gen income generating opportunities and building stable employment and businesses are central components of FAO's work. The FAO has put in place uh, some national, international instruments that take into account the rights of indigenous people. Uh, with, and these uh, uh, are the two voluntary guidelines mainly that I have up on the, on the wall here. And they put a special emphasis on so the social and economic aspects, such as rights to land and rights to natural resources, 
employment issue, community issues, social issues, and not least on gender issues, which are in, 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 in especially important uh, here as well as elsewhere. Now, these two uh, guidelines are uh, the response, uh, guidelines on vol uh, responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forests, and also guidelines on uh, for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries in the context of food security. But the FAO has also a policy of uh, regarding the private sector, and I'll just name a couple of key words in that respect, that is acceptance, uh, the issue of community concern, and the corporate good contact. Uh, now I come to the second part of my presentation, which is the sustainable management of living natural and marine resources. And uh, without sustainability, uh, there will be no possibility to establish or strengthen fisheries beyond activities aimed at being profitable activity and bringing benefits beyond subsistence. Uh, in this respect, we need to keep in mind that uh, fish and fishery products are among the most traded food commodities worldwide. And trade, fish trade, plays a major role in the fishery industry as a creator of employment, food supplier, income, uh, economic growth and development. And this food, uh, fish trade has been ex uh, considerably expanding in recent decades. Now, FAO and uh, UN as, as well have uh, developed several instruments, international instruments, which are very important, and I name but few uh, there, and uh, various agreements, uh, for example, fighting illegal fishing, IUU fishing, so-called, and, uh, and some of them are named uh, up there on the wall, but also the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, which is some co sort of Bible for us at the FAO when it comes to fisheries. And uh, also, I'd like to mention the eco-labeling guidelines, which are, have been very useful for our countries. And uh, FAO and climate change, the Arctic aspect is of course, very important and has been dealt with by uh, these uh, two key elements in the FAO's work, which is the Department for Fisheries, which is a huge department, one of the most important in, in the FAO, with almost 300 employees, uh, both in Rome and worldwide, and the Committee on Fisheries, which is the assembly of uh, member countries. And this, incidentally, is one of the... Uh, biggest gatherings of, of FAO and the United System, which meets uh, biannually. Now, FAO was, uh, had, was leading in establishing the so-called Global Partnership for Climate, Fisheries and Aquaculture, and uh, the Blue Growth uh, Initiative includes fisheries and is some sort of umbrella uh, program for all kinds of projects and initiatives and policies with regard to fisheries. And uh, within the, this framework, the FAO has launched at least 30 projects uh, involving climate change, most of them, of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, but all of them have significance for our, uh, for our work up here. Now, another aspect is important, which is the regional fisheries management uh, based on the fish tax agreement. There are about 60 such uh, bodies in the world, some big, some smaller, uh, some are strong, some are weak. We have the benefit of having two strong regional fisheries bodies, and I name two of them here, NEAFC and NAFO on the east and the west uh, coast of of Greenland, but of course there are several other uh, organizations operating. Uh, and uh, all these bodies somehow are connected into the FAO through a certain network, which I mentioned there at the bottom. Now we believe that there, are, there is a new momentum nowadays for, 
for fisheries and the oceans. And I list some of these uh, uh, important things there, like the sustainable development goals, the climate change negotiations, and of course, I should add, after our experience here today, uh, the ongoing work of the Arctic Circle and its importance for natural resources and fisheries. Now to conclude, a few points that we have already touched up some of them, the code of conduct, uh, climate change, enabling indigenous people to make use of existing international agreements, inclusion of indigenous people, strengthen RFMOs, and look ahead to developments with the interests of indigenous people in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you.